welcome you all to a conversation about media and democracy. Now, I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about money and politics, thinking about gerrymandering, spending my time worrying about voting rights. Um, but of course, if we do not have good information, it is really difficult to participate in a democracy. That in fact, we need to be, as much attention as we spend to voting, we need to be thinking about how we get information, how information comes from our community, and we need to be thinking about what's happening with media consolidation. We are incredibly blessed to have just a wonderful panel here today. Um, you will notice that biographies have been handed out, and that is because when we started putting this together, there were so many people that had ideas and things that they wanted to share about media consolidation and their concerns about the fourth estate. So, you know, before we knew it, we had all sorts of different opinions and different panelists, um, but those bios are because I'm going to say really simply, Mayor Whaley. Uh, it's, so I'm not going to give you kind of full biography. So um, a big thank you, as you might imagine, um, to the Center for Human Rights at the University of Dayton. Um, Joel Pruce arranged this, and we want to say thank you to him and to the Center for making this possible. We really just completely appreciate it. I also really wanted to say thank you, uh, and uh, I want to say thank you to the Kiplinger, uh, the Kiplinger Program for Public Interest Journalism. Um, now, this is at Ohio University, and anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more about kind of journalism today, the students of today, you will notice that um, we have the wonderful Kevin Z. Smith down here. So afterwards, make sure you get in touch with him and ask him questions about that program. If you want to talk more about human rights, you know, touch base with Joel. Now, I was so pleased that we were able to invite and have Yosef Gedichu come to talk with us. Now, he is the director of Media and Democracy for Common Cause. Come on down, Joseph. Yosef is coming here. And he's going to give us an overview. <laughs> Yosef is going to provide us an overview so that we have kind of a background in what's happening nationally and a little bit more information about this topic. And then we'll move into the panel. And once again, thank you all. Thank you, Yosef. Thank Thanks, Catherine, Ellis, and others for putting together this great event. My name is Yosef Gattachu, and I am the director of the Media and Democracy Program at Common Cause. Our Media and Democracy Program works to hold media accountable by promoting open and affordable communications networks and advancing as many diverse and independent voices in our media as possible. We do this in a lot of ways, grassroots mobilization, direct advocacy at the federal and state level, coalition building and, coalition, coalition building and press work. So before I continue, I actually want to take uh, an informal survey. This is something I do at a lot of these events. So show of hands here, how many people regularly watch local news or listen to local news on the radio or read their local paper? Wow. That's quite as many hands as I've seen in a while. OK. <laughs> Second question, though. How many of you know what's going on in your local community when it comes to your school board, when it comes to town, the town hall, when it comes to the housing authority, the state legislature, or any other local institution? Not as many hands, a few murmurs, a few questions here or there, not sure what's going on. But that's exactly why we're here today. We're here to talk about the state of our news and information and how it impacts our democracy. So currently, we're going through a crisis in journalism, as many of you have probably seen in the news. Since about the early 2000s, we've lost half of the reporters covering news and information. There's been a lot of ongoing consolidation over that time. Uh, private equity firms have taken over a third of the largest newspaper chains in this country. In combination with the private equity firms, there have been big media behemoths just gobbling up local television and radio stations, all in an effort to consolidate their resources and control what you see, what you hear, and what you read. 
This is a very big danger to our democracy. Because what we've seen during this consolidation is that our news and information has significantly diminished. Folks don't know what's going on in their own communities. They don't know what's going on in the town halls, the state legislatures, or their school boards. And there's a direct correlation between what you read and what you see in the news and how civically engaged you are. There are statistics that show those who watch local news and get robust information through local news are more likely to be active participants in their community. They're more likely to vote. They're more likely to talk to others about what they're seeing and to take action, to be civically engaged and fight against any type of bad policies they don't like. But the problem is, if they're not getting that news and information, if they're not actually knowing what's going on in their community, they're less likely to vote. They're less likely to sign a petition or to take action or to express any concerns about what's going on in their community. So while there's been ongoing media consolidation, there's been a significant decrease in the amount of deep dive investigative reporting and the amount of locally originated programming and the amount of communities who are informed about what's going on. So this has been an ongoing trend for quite a while. And what's going on at the federal level? We have an agency, the Federal Communications Commission, who is tasked with promoting policies that hold the media accountable. There are three pillars at the FCC that kind of inform our media policy and our democracy. Localism, the idea that news should be locally originated. It should be airing the interests of the communities that they serve. Diversity, it's the idea that your news and information should come from diverse sources, from women, from people of color, from those who are actually in the community. And competition, again, the idea that your news and information should come from a variety of areas, not just one entity that owns everything. And so these are the three pillars that have governed our media landscape for quite some time. Unfortunately, what we've seen at the federal level is a complete disregard for these principles and a complete deregulatory landscape uh, for quite some time. Over the past few years, we've had limits on how many television stations one entity can own. It used to be just seven TV stations. But over time, that number has been raised higher and higher and higher, giving one company the ability to buy up as many stations as possible. Right now, we have a cap at 39%. That means one station or one entity can own only 39% or can only have 39% of viewing households in the entire country, which is a significant amount. And there are loopholes around that too, where some companies actually figure out how they can get underneath that cap by buying up even more stations than they're actually allowed to. So we've had caps, and we've actually had policies. We've had cross-ownership policies. We've had uh, local television policies. These rules were actually designed to limit how many media entities one company can own. Unfortunately, we've had an FCC that's rolled back many of these rules. So now we're in a landscape where one entity can own the largest television station, the only local newspaper, and a handful of radio stations in one community. This is an incredible amount of consolidation in the hands of one company Again, being able to control what you see, what you read, and what you hear, impacting your level of civic engagement and impacting the democracy issues we all care about. So while this has been going on, we've had a number of media entities consolidate. The biggest one, one that we've been working on, is the Sinclair uh, Tribune merger. This was a merger that happened last year where Sinclair, a private company that owns over 200 television stations, tried to acquire Tribune, a company that owns about 40 to 42 television stations. If folks don't know, Sinclair is notorious, notorious for airing must-run content. This is the type of content where corporate headquarters <coughs> give scripts to its local anchors to read on broadcast television. And you, the local viewer, thinks this is coming from your local news station and your trusted local anchor, not knowing that these are segments force-fed from higher up. They tend to be pro-conservative, pro-Trump, and not necessarily locally originated. Sinclair is a very notorious company that does that. 
but this is just a symptom of the larger problems of media consolidation. We were very successful in blocking this merger, and the merger was derailed eventually by the FCC last year. But guess what? Another company is now trying to buy Tribune, Nexstar. Again, Nexstar is another large media entity that owns over 100 television stations. If they do acquire Tribune, they'll be even larger than Sinclair. Now, Nexstar doesn't actually have the notoriety that Sinclair does when it comes to airing must-run segments. But guess what Nexstar does? They consolidate. What that means is they fire news staff and journalists. They consolidate newsrooms. They shutter stations, all in an effort to cut costs. News Nexstar actually has this business model of regional hubs. They like to buy television stations in nearby markets and all of a sudden consolidate the resources of all those television stations in nearby markets. So all of a sudden, you could be living in one town getting the same type of news if you're living in another town. And we have statistics that show this. About half of Americans say they get news and information from a, uh, in a community that they do not live in. This isn't local news. This isn't information you need to make informed decisions about your democracy. So what's actually going on in Dayton? Well, if folks don't know, there is a current merger pending at the FCC. <laughs> Apollo Global Management is a private equity firm that is seeking to buy Cox and also seeking to buy Northwest Broadcasting. Cox, for years and years, has owned WHIO-TV, the Daily Dayton News, and a handful of radio stations in Dayton, Ohio. Over the years, Cox has actually consolidated the functions of these newsroom stations to the point where it's not as robust as it used to be. There is anecdotal information of reporters for the newspaper actually covering stories for the television station, and vice versa. Again, we had policies in the past that separated these out, that actually get, got you diverse sources of news and information, so we, you weren't relying on one source, or you weren't getting this brand of cookie-cutter journalism that's not actually giving you the information you need to make informed decisions. But let's talk about Apollo. Apollo is notorious for cost-cutting. There are vulture capitalists, hedge funds that actually see entities that are may be in distress, not doing as well profitably, and going in there, gobbling them up, and cutting costs. These are what private equity firms do. They find distressed entities, they cut costs, and they return those investments to their shareholders. And this is the problem. Local news is a public value, it's a public resource. Broadcast spectrum, broadcast television stations is a, is, is a public resource. We, the people, own the airwaves. So if we are giving these up to private entities, we expect something in return. We expect to have local news and information. We expect to have programming that meets the interests of our communities, and we expect to have diverse sources of information. Unfortunately, that's not where we are. And if Apollo does acquire a Cox, it's very likely that they're gonna cut costs, fire newsroom employees, and consolidate news functions to the point where an already consolidated newsroom in Dayton could get a lot worse. There's potential for you all to get less local news and information, less deep dive investigative reporting, and the information you need to actually make informed decisions about your democracy. And again, Apollo is just a symptom of the larger problem. I mentioned Sinclair and Tribune, I mentioned Nexar and Tribune. There are a handful of mergers that are currently getting green lighted at the FCC. So to wrap up, are we in a doom and gloom situation where all hope is lost and one entity can control what we see and do on, on uh, our broadcast TV? I say no, there are a few steps we can take. First is to just stop green lighting these mergers at the local and federal level. These mega mergers are a danger to our democracy. The second is to actually start thinking about new sources of journalism that are transitioning to the digital landscape. What does that look like? Yeah, the current models don't work, so we have to start thinking about how to transition to get more and more people to listen and watch local news. And third, we have to think about how our local communities interact with journalists and local news. How do we get our stories covered? How do we get those untold stories, those underreported stories from communities that often go unseen and unheard? If we take these steps, we can have a much more democratic media ecosystem. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Yosef. So we are blessed with a wonderful panel, and to kick that off, we have Mayor Nan Whaley, and I'm just going to hand this over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Nan Whaley, Mayor of Dayton, and I see a lot of friendly faces and advocates here uh, that come to see me quite regularly. And first, I just want to say thank you for that continued act activism and advocacy that you do on behalf of your views for our community. As I was thinking of coming here this, mor this afternoon, this morning, I thought of a couple of jokes, and I already told Ellis them. And um, I want to mention Ellis Jacobs, who, when I got concerned about this, he was my first call, who does a lot of this great work, and certainly appreciate Ellis's leadership, even uh, constantly in the community. But uh, the the thought, the first thought I had was, you know, there are two rules uh, to be an elect elected official, and the first one is. Never pick a fight with people that buy ink by the barrel. And the second one is if you want a friend in politics, get a dog. So uh, I don't have either right now is what I'm doing. I don't have a dog and I think you know, I'm picking a bit of a fight. But I think it's really important for our community to stand up and talk about this. And so that's why I decided to really advocate and come today. Uh, first, I want to say uh, I've been elected for about 14 years now. And so the change in coverage and the disruption that I have seen being covered has been pretty uh, terrific in change. I'm not terrific good, but just pretty amazing. And you know, um, from the days when I first ran for Dayton City Commission in 2005, where an elected official would fret over who the Dayton Daily News would endorse, uh, to working on judge races because the Dayton Daily News endorsement meant the most of any endorsement you could get running for judge, to see that completely abdicated by the paper, I, I think it was their true value add. And then to see just the number of journalists uh, become less and less and the amount of coverage that they're able to do because they're doing more and more has really affected our community. I do want to make the point that I think the journalists that we have in this community for the most part are incredibly diligent, incredibly fair, and are doing their very best work they can under very, very difficult circumstances. So I want to make that very, very clear. Um, I don't think they're the issue at all. I just am very concerned about what they're being asked to do and what that, that has had an effect on our community. And so I'm no journalist, we have some great journalists here, but I will give a couple of examples of why I'm concerned across the state and just how I see the coverage uh, changing, uh, not for the better in the case of democracy, okay? So um, I think I talk to a reporter just about every single day in my job. And so I, you know, I probably talk to them more than any other elected official in the region. Uh, sometimes I don't talk to them, right? You know, there's times I do that. but. Uh, uh, the, the amount of stories that they have to cover now is a lot more than it was even five years ago. So there's no depth anymore because there's just no time for that depth. There's a lot, I mean, I feel very lucky the city of Dayton still has a beat reporter. A lot of places don't have a beat reporter anymore, so there's no relationships, and so there's no real reason for an elected official to decide to build trust or even have a conversation because we, you know, you start to think of like, well, they're as, they have the attention span is the same as the person reading Facebook, and so why am I going to spend the time trying to explain this complex issue? That happens because of the change, uh, the change in coverage. First, uh, over half P Pew Charitable Trust did a study just last year. Over half of the people actually get their news first from Facebook. Now, what's important is, is once that news comes, they go to the local source. Okay, so if you, typically what happens is someone will go on Facebook, see their friend has said something. And then they'll go to the local source to say, okay, what's really happening? And so that's why that's so important. So this isn't, I have other issues with Facebook. Maybe we'll have a panel some other day about their issues. But that is really important to have that local source backed up so people can go and see what's really going on. And if we don't have a local source, I'm really concerned at what kind of mistruths that are going to be happening. Secondly, uh, many of you know my, my husband is, uh, was, uh, father was uh, Buck Spraun, who was a longtime radio personality in town. He died about a year ago. And his, um, his nephew, Rob Braun, was a, a, a reporter in Cincinnati. And Rob was um, on one of those Sinclair stations that you have talked about. And when they made him do original content, he refused. And it made national news. And about a month ago, not surprisingly, Sinclair let him go. And so that's what you're seeing with this kind of national buying of local. It's the local is leaving. The journalists don't have a say. 
And that is very, very dangerous when we're talking about something like Apollo coming into our community. Also, Sinclair does have a station here in Dayton. It's 2245, so that you're, if you're watching any of that, you're getting some of that news that uh, Yosef was talking about. So, um, I wanna also mention, I'm super grateful every day that we have the Dayton Daily News. Uh, earlier this month, the Youngstown Vindicator announced that it would be closing after 152 years. That is very scary for a local community not to have uh, um, an, a place of record. So making sure that people understand this is a conversation about us making sure that the Dayton Daily News stays here and stays local is really, really important. And then I'll just share a story about um, the tornadoes. So we had a lot of coverage May 25th and 26th around the tornadoes. And actually I did three press conferences a day uh, over the course of two and a half days. So about, I think total we did eight press conferences story during that, that like 48 hours. And what blew our mind is we felt like we had all the reporters come, we'd come every morning, noon and night, whenever we had something to report. But what would we hear in the feedback on Facebook? And I mean, and, and also the, um, we were, pre I understand we were like preempted, like they'd just go right to the, the press conference on TV. But most of what we saw on Facebook from what we of course watch was uh, where is the city? Why isn't the city doing anything? And it made us really realize just how much information is now getting on Facebook that people are missing because they're not watching local journalism. So I hope you'll consider and really act being active in stopping this merger for the future of our community. But we know we have other things we need to do and that local journalism is a community value. So there's cities like Austin, for example, that decided that they needed a nonprofit paper because that's how important it is to democracy that we have to have it. And so even if it means we have to have nonprofit sources, we need to make sure that happens. And so I hope this group, in addition to stopping this merger, continues to work on what we need to do to make sure that journalism thrives in Dayton. Thanks for having me. So I don't know if you've been blessed, you've noticed how blessed we are, that there's almost not enough room for all of us. If you were somebody who wants a seat, come on down, they're in the front seat. Um, so you might have to get a little closer than you're used to, a little, but we would love to have you come, make yourself at home up here. There are about six seats up here, so please make your way up. And on that note, um, I'm gonna hand you off to uh, veteran reporter Bob Daly. Oh, thank you. We're gonna applaud for Bob, right? You gonna applaud? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Mayor. I got three points to make in three minutes, and I'm on the clock. <laughs> First, I've been asked why I signed Common Causes pe petition to deny the application. I've been keenly interested in newspapers since I first learned that Superman had a day job. <laughs> <laughs> Dayton has been my adopted hometown since 1997, and the Dayton Daily News is my hometown newspaper. I care deeply about this community. I care that my fellow citizens live the good life too, are treated fairly, and have a voice in their government. Without a strong newspaper, how are citizens to get the information they need to keep the government and the community going? Second, at the end of World War II, Dayton had three daily newspapers, the Journal, the Herald, and the Dayton Daily News. The Journal and the Herald merged in the late 1940s. In the mid-1950s, the Journal, Herald, and Daily News moved into a new building on South Ludlow Street. Reporters remained fiercely independent news gatherers. With the coming of the Internet age, Cox closed the Journal, Herald, and brought the Daily News, WHIO-TV, and its radio stations into a single newsroom with a significant reduction in staff, a corresponding loss of community memory, and the crushing decision to eliminate the editorial page. Now, I agree with the mayor. Today's journalists are hardworking, as hardworking as they were in, uh, in my day. It's the business model that has changed, which has made their jobs that more difficult. Third, it is not good when a private equity firm takes over a newspaper. Staff layoffs and the sale of assets usually follow. This is an especially bad time for our community to face a newspaper makeover. 
we have major problems that a strong local newspaper needs to address and keep the community informed. They include the city and the county are arguing over water issues. Dayton, which recently hosted a Ku Klux Klan rally, is the 14th most segregated city in the country. We're recovering from a series of tornadoes that cost $500 million in damages. Dayton Public Schools are the worst in Ohio. And the U.S. Attorney recently indicted four men here for misconduct. One is a former Dayton City Commissioner who was indicted for accepting a bribe while in office. It has been a reminder that a newspaper's most important responsibility is to serve as a watchdog holding elected officials accountable. The FBI feels the indictments confirm there is a culture of corruption in the Dayton area and the investigation continues. God forbid our community should become a news desert. Thank you very much, Bob. So next we have Professor Proust. This is Joel Proust, um, who is with the University of Dayton. Um, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. Great, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the bedrock document of international human rights, clearly lays out how media and democracy are fundamentally connected. In Article 19, the document reads, everyone has the right of, to freedom of opinion and expression this right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontier. It's not enough to have an opinion and be free to express it in public without concern. Additionally, the Universal Declaration recognizes how the exchange of information and ideas through media shapes how we exercise our rights, which in turn affects the richness of our societies, the health of our democracies, and the freedom and dignity of all individuals. And to put it bluntly, consolidation of media outlets in the hands of a few private actors represents a direct threat to human rights and democracy, two systems already confronting an existential risk, not from without, but from within. A free, functioning media is essential to the battle communities across the country are currently waging in defense of human rights against an unrelenting attack by this administration. Fewer news outlets that represent fewer voices remove an invaluable tool for political accountability, which is especially crucial given the rampant corruption and abuse of the ruling party. For local activists, this is experienced in an acute way. Melissa Rodriguez, who was slated to be here tonight but couldn't at the last minute, wanted to emphasize this point. To counter the official narrative, driven by elites and powerful interests, our community is already frustrated, struggling to make our voices heard with respect to what's going on. What are our stories? Where are our perspectives? What's important to us? What are our challenges and what are our triumphs? Getting coverage and correcting misinformation is practically a full-time job, and additional capitalist consolidation of media exacerbates this problem. So then, what to do? In the presence of capitalist media consolidation, the community must respond. Privately owned, for-profit news is not the only viable model, and we have uh, ample examples right here in our region. For instance, the efforts being led by Co-op Dayton extend beyond food justice and the Gem City market. Because when we, as neighbors and workers, own the amenities in our community, we control the shape they take, the money stays here, and the accountability rests with us. Community-owned media platforms are a suitable and appropriate response to consolidation as well. The obvious example here is WISO, our NPR station. As an independent nonprofit outlet, WISO embodies public service rooted in a place and conjoined to a people. So our call to action tonight is not simply a reaction to this proposed merger, but rather we're here to register our opposition publicly and spark new directions for media freedom because we appreciate how indispensable it is to the protection of human rights and the vitality of our democracy. Thank you. So I met Jim DeBras a few years ago. Um, at this point, it feels like it might be 15 years ago. We're talking money and politics. Um, and we are blessed to have another veteran reporter. This is Jim DeBras. Um, we'd like to hear what you're thinking. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Incredible turnout here tonight. I'm, I'm 
very encouraged. Um, I wanted to talk mostly about newspapers because that's where I have 30 plus years of experience. Plus, I don't think people really realize that newspapers are, are the driving force behind the news. TV and radio so often just follow on the heels of what newspapers have already reported and uncovered. So newspapers are really you know, ground zero when it comes to reporting. But a newspaper is a funny thing. It can look like you, the reader, are getting a decent product for your money, when actually you're being robbed blind. If all a publisher cares about is the bottom line, they can hire a minimum number of reporters, just enough to get around to the fires, the accidents, the crime stories that dominate the headlines on TV and radio news. But what readers are not getting is the news behind the news, because that handful of reporters are so busy chasing all over town for what we call breaking news that they don't have the time to discover the news behind the news, the real news. A couple of examples. A Dayton surgeon, let's call him Dr. Burt, <laughs> claims to be doing an innovative surgery that makes women more sexually responsive. He calls it his love surgery. If a reporter doesn't have the time to check the court records for lawsuits against Dr. Burt, or enough time to reach out to other surgeons for their views on this surgery, readers will never learn that Dr. Burt is actually butchering his patients. His love surgery is not only unnecessary and ineffective, but can lead to incontinence and an inability to have sex at all. One more example. A reporter gets a call from the public relations person at Wright State University. Hey, we have a clinical psychologist here who has just published a book about his experience helping prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, or better known as Gitmo, the military detention facility for accused terrorists. Would you like to interview him about his exciting new book? A reporter who doesn't have time to do a thorough internet search wouldn't know that a prominent human rights organization has asked to revoke the professional license of this psychologist in two states. Why? Because of his participation in torturing pr prisoners at Gitmo. These are just two examples of the real news behind the news. They happen every day on nearly every story a reporter handles. Without sufficient staffing, you, the reader, aren't getting the news. You're getting advertising. You're getting marketing. You're getting propaganda. The owners of a newspaper can't be looking only for a return on investment. They have a responsibility to inform their readers that goes far beyond simply selling a profitable commodity. Newspapers don't belong just to their owners. They belong to their communities. Thank you. We now are going to hear from Kevin Smith. Now, Kevin is with the Kiplinger F Program for Public Interest Journalism at Ohio University. And thank you so much for joining us and coming all this way to come uh, get, hear your thoughts. We're looking oh. forward to it. Oh. Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Normally, I um, print my stuff out. And I'm old school, so I read from notes. But my printer didn't work, so hence I have my laptop in front of me. <clears throat> so bear with me. In the time that I have before me, um, it's not my intention to speak to the benefits of private equity firms and their approach to buying media houses. Uh, that history was established not so long ago, and the path of destruction has been well documented <clears throat> in Denver, San Jose, Providence, Columbus, and many more cities. The Washington Post has described them as cash flow mercenaries who slash jobs and sell buildings more interested in owning an outlet for a few years, draining it of its resources and dumping it. But what I want to talk about in the time that I have here isn't the latest trend to kill off newspapers, but rather the slow and painful trend of the past 10 to 15 years that set the stage for mercenaries like Digital First, Gatehouse, and now Terrier Media, Buyer, Inc. The slow slide of the Dayton Daily News and the vast majority of other newspapers in this country has nothing to do with private equity firms. 
but the slow and steady decline of readership and revenue. The Dayton Daily News circulation numbers, like those of nearly all newspapers, has slid precipitously. Once a paper of 240,000 daily readers, it now hovers around 90,000. So like many other outlets, they actively and wisely created a digital president, presence while laptops, pads, and mobile phones made access to news electronic. The reality of industry economics is that newspapers, which once enjoyed a profit margin of 20 to 30 percent, began seeing their profit margins slip to 10 and 12 percent in 2008, around the time of the Great Recession. And that slide has continued, and many are happy now if they can get 5 to 6 percent on their investment. That does not make shareholders happy. As print um, has moved to digital, they've also learned there too that revenue is not what they hoped it would be. Producing pennies on the dollar as investment in technology becomes expensive. Now, I get it. Twelve years ago, you take out a classified ad in a newspaper if you wanted to sell your Bowflex. Now you pop over to Craigslist or eBay and you do it there. More eyes, more comfort, easier to do. Additionally, and this can be an entire different subject, Facebook and Google have destroyed ad revenue streams for newspapers, retail, and other sectors. I have been told that Terrier really wants the TV station, WHIO, <clears throat> to forge into the broadcasting market, and the newspaper and the radio are part of the package because Cox Media Ohio is one of the totally converged media groups, newsrooms in the country. And it's been that way for the last eight years. To get one, you have to take all three. It's also been suggested that Cox has elected to retain minority ownership in the company with the express concern that they want to make sure that the paper wasn't strip mined completely and that they continue to do the work on behalf of the community. Of course, all of that remains to be seen. Newspaper journalism has seen staffing fall from around 300,000 journalists before the Great Recession of 2008 to 133,000 journalists last year. Revenue for newspaper industries has dropped about 28% from 2018 to 2020. 28% of revenue is gone in two years. Newspaper advertising is expected to fall nationally to around $14 billion in 2020. In 2006, it was $56 billion. 75% drop in advertising revenue in 13 years. TV stations are better, but no longer the cash cows that they once were, and Netflix and others are directly challenging them. Equity, equity firms are desperate to invest and increase profit margins by dramatically cutting expenses with little or no regard to what that means. Journalism has lived off a business model that has collapsed. Journalism is suffering because the public doesn't see value in paying for news. They want it free on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. In conclusion, I will say this. The bottom line, when it comes to the bottom line, is that paying for news can cost you a little, or not paying for it can invite equity firms to come in and end up costing you a lot more, not just in your wallet, but for your community. Thank you. So much information. <laughs> and now we're going to hear from Tom Roberts, who a former member of the General Assembly, um, and he is the president of the NAACP Ohio chapter. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Let me uh, first start out with a disclaimer. We only have one ruling body in NAACP, and that's the National Board. And so my comments will not be that of a policy position of the NAACP but as a citizen in this community for over 60-some years, a civil rights advocate and a former, a former uh, politician mayor. 
<laughs> and I firmly, as, as most of you know, I've always talked about the role of democracy and the media and democracy. And, and this is the role I think democracy, uh, media plays in our democracy, keeping the citizens informed, keeping the citizens aware of the issues before us, civic engagement, telling about where the candidates are coming from, where, as Bob Daly pointed out, some of the more critical issues in our community. So I think the role of, of the media is important. As a civil rights advocate, had it not been for the media, most of the world would not have known about Birmingham or Montgomery or any of the atrocities going on in the South and in the North, by the way. So the media plays a very strong role for us in civil rights. And probably about 19, uh, 2002, because of the NAACP's interest in the image of African Americans on TV going back to the birth of a nation, in 2002, we put together the, uh, the Hollywood Bureau. And the Hollywood Bureau's job is to make sure that the uh, movies that are put out, the cinematography, and the newspapers print and deliver people of color in a positive sense. And so from that point of view, I think it's a critically important that we talk about the media and how it portrays people, but also that they get the story right. From my point of view, it's those relationships that Springfield and Dayton has built up with that news media. They're able to communicate with those news camera before, in front of, or behind the camera. And that's part of what I think the strong community relationship that the news media brings to us. When we know the camera people, we know the people behind the scene, we know the reporters, the editors, we can communicate with them and they can present our story. And so for me, I think that's the important critical part if this goes forward then we need to be able to make sure that the people in front and behind the camera look like and act as I do, a person of color. One of the, uh, one of the uh, programs of the NAACP is called the Image Award, and they recognize people in the, uh, in the media or in Hollywood. And in 2014, uh, the Image Award was given to uh, Kerry Washington, and she said something I think will wrap up where I'm coming from before I do an ask, right, Catherine? And she said, just as we must ensure that we the people includes all Americans regardless of race, class, gender, and sexual orientation, we must also work to ensure that the stories we tell, the movies we make, the televisions we produce, and the newspapers are inclusive in the same way. The media should represent the people, they should speak for the people that cover uh, that they are covering. My ask, uh, someone's going to pass these out to you. If you hearing what the panels have said and you want to share your thoughts uh, with the uh, PU, with the um, Federal Communications F Commission. Federal Commu FCC, Federal Communication Commission, fill out or go to the site that they're going to pass. I'll go to the site and if you are uh, digitally inclined, you click on this little uh, QR code <laughs> and it will tell you what to do. So we're asking tonight if you have heard what the panels have said, you're interested in sharing your thoughts with the Federal Communication Commission, then to do something, to take some action tonight. I think the, the hearing is sometime in September, is that correct? Or Sometimes so this soon. sounds like a good question yeah. for the panel. Sometimes soon. And so the ask is to do it sooner than later. Thank you. So we were blessed to hear from all these wonderful people. So I'm going to ask a few questions. And then in about 15 minutes, I'm going to have you ask your questions as well. Um, so Ellis Jacobs, um, who is really, he was uh, the person who encouraged us all to put this together in the first place. You'll notice he, uh, yes, thank you, Ellis. He will be helping kind of organize, but uh, as you can see, there's a microphone towards the center. So the first kind of question that I am going to ask is going to go to Kevin Smith, because um, I listened to that information he provided, and I was like, oh. And so this is the question I have, Mr. Smith. Um, private equity firms are buying up newspapers and local media at this really rapid rate. Now, with all the challenges um, that are facing the news industry, why do these private equity firms actually want to acquire local media? Um, 
it's very simple. It's, it's all about finances. It has nothing to do with anything but finances. So prior to, prior to the recession of 2008, if you wanted to buy a media outlet, in particular if you wanted to buy a newspaper, the rule of thumb was that you had to pay 13 times its yearly earnings. 13 times its yearly earnings. So let's say the newspaper made $10 million. So if you wanted to buy that newspaper, it was going to cost you roughly $130 million to buy it. After the recession and after the digital explosion and print began to start hemorrhaging its readerships, um, that number by 2014 had dropped to three times a yearly earning. Three times. So that became a bright, shiny object for um, equity firms. When you saw something that was valued at $130 million 10 years ago that was now valued at about $30 million or $13 million, I'm sorry, um, now it became lucrative to invest in that. So that, that's one of the primary reasons. Yosef, do you have anything you want to add? Sure. So not to speak on the profitability of newspapers, uh, I can definitely say that private equity firms see local television as still a cash cow. Uh, there was actually an article that came out uh, about a month or two ago from Vanity Fair profiling Apollo's attempted acquisition of Cox. And there was a quote from Leon Black, one of the executives of Apollo, who said, local television gets senators elected. That tells you everything you need to know about why private equity firms want to get into this business. One, it's still somewhat profitable. And two, there's still a major influence that local television has on democracy issues, on representatives, on uh, members of Congress. And they can see this as a potential way of currying favor, of getting advertising dollars, political revenue, and building their profile. Uh, there was a same article that said, hey, Apollo may want to rival Sinclair and Nexstar as the next media conglomerate. And this is the way to do it. This is their foot into the door, and they want to feel, they want to see how much power they can get. Does anybody else want to add something? All right, on that note, I have a question for the mayor. What is the relationship between local news and government at the state and local level? Oh, keep unwrapping this up. Uh, the, no, sorry. That's all right. Uh, for, I think for us in the, in the local community, I mean, I never agree with what the paper or the TV says every day. I mean, obviously there's times where I heartily disagree with it. Uh, but I think it's a good relationship. You know, we know we respect each other's roles. We expect, respect each other what we need to do. And we recognize in the local community, it's just still an effective way to get your message out, especially if you want to tell people what's going on in the community. Uh, in the state, uh, again, I just see the decimation of the state uh, press corps uh, as pretty, pretty discouraging. And fr quite frankly, I don't think many people, even in this room, and you are the readers of the Dayton Daily News, and I, no offense, there's like barely anybody under the age of 40 in this room, and so there's nobody under 40 really reading the Dayton Daily News, which is a challenge. I mean, this is a big issue, especially as, as we talk about generational, but even people that read the Dayton Daily aren't getting a lot of news from what's going on in the state. And um, that's because there's only one reporter there, and, um, and then we used to have, uh, Audi used to do, and Channel 7 used to do more reporting uh, up in Columbus, and now he's now more in Dayton, uh, again, just to keep it tighter. And so there is really very little coverage going on in the State House. And this isn't just for Dayton, this is across the state, and it's, it's, a, it's a real problem because there's a lot going on at that State House, i.e., couldn't get a budget done in two weeks when everybody was at the same party. Seems a little bizarre what's going on. You know, not a lot of discussion about it because there's just not much coverage. And I also think. For us and the frustration we have of being covered, you know, yeah, these issues are complex. Government is, you know, a bureaucracy. It's a process, and the coverage has changed. And, and look, I think, you know, this is a big issue that's deeper than this this takeover. Uh, when people will watch a video for 10 seconds, <laughs> 10 seconds. That's what the studies say. You know, we're not going to be able to get news in 10 seconds. And so, you know, we really have to have a larger discussion too about valuing. Uh, news and journalism and attention spans, frankly, to really find out what's going on here. So, uh, but the relationship, I think, with us is, I, you know, I have great respect for what they do. I found a Senator Roberts email. 
So I was going to say, Tom, do you have something you'd like to add? Thank you, Mayor. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it, so, so I was asking this probably because I actually do spend a lot of time with the State House Press Corps, and I am interested in one, um, the mayor is absolutely correct. Um, so it used to be that I would put together approximately 45 of my releases, my press releases, and I would go to the state house and then I would, you know, I'd deliver them over to the plane dealer and there'd be five different reporters there. And, and now if we're lucky if we have one reporter. You know, there's no Akron Beacon Journal reporter there. There's no Canton mm -hmm. Repository reporter there. Um, if we run into a plain dealer reporter, we're fortunate. So, so things have really changed. And so my question really had to do with the intersection of the state and local news and how, how you see this coming together and how, how people are getting their information, et cetera. So I really read the clips. So I get access to gong work now and then the clips so I can find out what's going on in, in Columbus. But I didn't know the Akron Beacon Journal wasn't there because they were th the fantastic job of covering. And then Bob told me that Youngstown, you know, Youngstown is one of the school, one the, one of the uh, school district that state took over. And I think the people in that community were getting their news about what was happening from the Youngstown newspaper. So now that's gone. So I think to have the local newspapers available in getting the news at the state house and the county and the city is valuable to us. And I think people read more newspapers than we think because a lot of us baby boomers still don't understand Facebook. Someone told me I, I lost my phone. They said, you didn't back it up to the cloud. I said, what cloud, you know? <laughs> so, so I still think we, we, I still want to hold something in my hands on a, on a regular basis when I read it. So I read a couple of papers, but I read the clips. So I think the importance of having uh, the news media uh, at the State House is important. In fact, we have a section set aside just for media at the State House so that you cover, so that the activities are being covered. But the old schools, you know, the newspaper was called the Fourth Estate, remember? at one point because they were a valuable pillar of, of our community along with the clergy and I forget the other, other three Bob but they were a part of, of helping the community stabilize itself and I like the comment someone made about a moral, uh, a moral uh, uh, piece of our community because I think that's what, that's what we ought to be looking at a public value and a community memory you know and I think that's what we're missing we're missing the community memory we're missing the piece about a public value. And so that's why I think we need to make sure we have a, a newspaper in our communities in Springfield and Dayton to cover what we're all about. So for many of you, you're probably having a paper that's coming by you that has the QR code on it, um, but it's actually, it's bit.ly backslash Dayton Media. And um, Dayton's capitalized and media is capitalized. And that'll take you directly to a site where you can comment, which leads to my next question. Uh, so I don't know a lot about the Federal Communications Commission. I don't know how it works. I don't understand exactly what the next steps actually are. Um, I don't understand how Bob actually decided to do this. Um, and so this is a question both to Yosef and to Bob about how it is that he filed the, you know, uh, he filed his petition, what that actually means, what are next steps. I, I just don't understand the process. And I'm guessing a lot of us actually don't know what happens at the Federal Communications Commission. And on that note, I'm handing it to Yosef. Sure. So this goes back to the comments I made earlier. Local television stations operate on public airwaves or spectrum as the people in the government call it. But these airwaves are owned by us. They're, they're publicly owned and they're just licensed out to private companies. And so there are policies in place that say, hey, if we're gonna license out public airwaves, then you have to give something back to the community in the form of local news, diverse programming, competitive aspects to the media. And so what ends up happening is if a private company wants to sell their public airwaves that they're licensed or buy the public airwaves from another company, they have to get approval from the Federal Communications Commission. And this is really the important part for all of us here because that approval has a public comment period where everyday people can actually weigh in and say, hey, I don't think that this publicly, uh, public license should get transferred to another company. I like the current owner, I like what they're doing, or I don't like what they're doing, but it could get worse. And so what ended up happening uh, earlier 
this year in the spring, uh, Apollo filed uh, an application to buy Cox media stations, as well as Northwest Broadcasting stations at the FCC. The FCC put Apollo's application on public notice, giving the public the opportunity to comment. Common Cause, uh, with one of our allies in D.C., as well as Common Cause Ohio, filed a petition to deny the merger. We laid out the legal and policy implications of Apollo, a private equity firm, buying up uh, Cox Media. And so uh, once we filed that petition, there is a review process going on at the FCC right now. It's uh, an informal 180-day shot clock. So from the day they actually put the application on public notice back in, I want to say it was May, uh, we have 180 days informally. It could be longer, it could be shorter, before the FCC makes a decision. So without actually having any hard information on when the decision is coming, it could potentially be early fall or it could be later or earlier. We're, we're not quite sure. But that gives all of you the opportunity to voice your opinion at the FCC to say, no, I don't want this private equity firm buying my local television station or the radio station. It's a danger to our democracy, and I want more local news and information. So that's the general process. I'm happy to talk more in depth about the wonkiness of this, but the big thing is when there's a license transfer, you, the public, have the opportunity to voice your opinion about that. Well, I got involved uh, early on. I had heard in, uh, in February, I think, uh, Jim Bevington, the editor of the Dayton Daily News, spoke out in Washington Township, and he, his, uh, his presentation was interrupted because he had a phone call, and afterwards he, he said, I had a bit of news to report, and that is that the... Uh, the mic, uh, uh, <laughs> and, Anyway, I, I heard early on Jim Bevington said that uh, that the uh, Dayton Daily News was sold. Uh, he just heard about it uh, on a telephone call from the office. So I'd been following this for a while, and then uh, I, I, a mutual friend put me in touch with with Ellis, and uh, and I expressed we expressed our concerns to each other. He said, "Do you want to be involved?" And I said, "You bet." And so uh, it, it just transpired. So I was able to deal with Yosef on, uh, in about three days. We put together my declaration, and he filed it, I think, literally the afternoon of May 10th before the deadline. Thank you for your leadership, Bob, in that. Um, so this is a question for um, both the journalism professor, um, but also the retired reporters. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the challenges and problems. I bet um, uh, Professor Proust might also have something to add here. Um, I'm interested in what do you see as sustainable models? What are possibilities? I, you know, I've heard a little bit about the possibility of nonprofit journalism, um, but what what are the kinds of changes that need to be made so that we see a light at the end of the tunnel. And who would like to take it? Oh, Jim would like to take it. Okay, good. This is Jim DeBross. I'm not the real expert here on finances, but I do know some of the trends that have been occurring locally and nationally as far as creating alternatives to uh, newspapers and uh, what you would call the, the for-profit media. Uh, you're seeing a lot of bloggers um, who are reporting on their, their local councils, villages, townships, etc. cetera. Um, I know this, I, I live in Cincinnati now, I see this a lot. Uh, there's sort of gadflies or watchdogs. Um, that's one sort of alternative, but I think even more important, uh, you're seeing these sort of nonprofit investigative uh, organizations springing up, uh, such as ProPublica on the national level, which has won number of pulled us for prizes now for their investigative journalism. But here in Ohio, we have something that's trying to get off the ground in Columbus called Eye on Ohio, which is a nonprofit uh, investigative um, agency organization. They're having a terrible time raising money, however. Uh, they're not getting a lot of support from the um, uh, NPR, local NPR uh, stations, unfortunately. Um, and and by, by contrast, Louisville 
uh, has an incredible uh, nonprofit investigative uh, organization called um, the Kentucky Center for Investigative Journalism. And it's based in Louisville, has a very close relationship uh, with the NPR station there, and they just do a bang up job of covering Kentucky. We really need something like that in Ohio, but as I said, uh, this Columbus organization is just struggling. You know, this isn't, um, this isn't a particularly easy question to answer because um, we've had now almost 10 years to try to come up with a solution and it's not, I was president of the largest journalism organization in this country in 2009 to 2010 and I spent a lot of time sitting on panels called the future of journalism, <clears throat> talking about where things were going. And we've seen a number of different models that were put forth and they struggled a little bit. There was hyper-local content where, you know, you drilled down to every street, uh, every block of every street as a way because the thought was that's where people want to know what's going on in the community. There was entrepreneurship programs. Uh, New York University started the first entrepreneurial program in journalism where you would come up with innovative ways to create content and and um, news functions <clears throat> and and we've had you know the idea that also has been kicked around of having um, and I don't think it'll fly in this environment but there was a talk 10 years ago of having a public trust where tax dollars would be put into a public trust and help support media in this country based upon their circulation, based upon their outreach and so forth, much like you have with public broadcasting. None of those really gained a lot of traction. Now what you have mentioned about um, the uh, sort of nonprofit, that seems to be where the trend is now. And it seems to be doing fairly well. A lot of journalists who have been displaced in their jobs have coalesced and have started nonprofit organizations because they seriously believe in their community and they believe in reporting. And they, it's that important to them that they don't see their newspapers gutted and people left wondering what's going on. So that seems to be the trend. Does it, is it sustainable? It's sustainable in the hearts of the journalists, but financially, there's where people need to make contributions and they need to support it. If, if you, and again, I'll go back to finance, if you, if you think that creating news content for you to read every day is cheap, it's not. It costs, it costs a lot. And to give away news for free is something that newspapers and TV stations did, and they found the error of their ways, and that's why you have paywalls sometimes. And I'm on social media every day and I hear people complaining because they have to pay to see a news story. You know, there, there's not much alternatives. Um, those people can't function without, without uh, financial sources. So uh, this is the other thing that I wondered about as I listened to this panel. Um, Professor Proust talked about the connection to human rights and one of the things I wondered about is whether the challenges that we're talking about are challenges that are happening all over the world, um, because clearly when we're talking about human rights, it takes it to thinking about the whole planet. And so I wanted to throw it to you, and this will take me a minute to hand it over to you. Okay, sounds like a plan. I, uh, thank you. I, I don't have a fully global uh, sense of the scope of this. I think the United States is unique in many ways in terms of, you know, advanced industrialized democracies. Sure. In terms of, uh, you know, other advanced industrialized democracies, we don't have public broadcasting, not a robust public broadcasting like, like BBC or, or CBC. And so those would be the kind of systems that, you know, I would look to. But, you know, uh, the United States is a uniquely uh, United States sort of a place. You know, I mean, no, but, you know, but the, the, the very notion that, you know, we should pay for something because it's a public good is sort of antithetical to our culture in a lot of ways. And this is very much the result of that. The result of that is someone else should pay for it. It shouldn't be the government because I don't want to pay taxes. And someone should give it to me for free. And my money should go to something that serves myself rather than something that serves my community or the public. 
And so this is very much a result of that, that cultural dynamic, you know, I think. Um, and this is, I think Kevin mentioned it, this is a long time coming. It's death by a thousand cuts. And when it's gone, you know, it'll be with a whatever, not a, you know, a whimper and not a, et cetera. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for alternatives. And that doesn't mean that, you know, particularly in, in local communities, you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, try to provide that public service uh, ourselves. Um, but I, I don't know that there's an international uh, comparison. All right. So my last question, I'm, uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, one of the things that I've worried about has to do with the stories that we don't hear. And so I, I would like to hear what are the stories that you feel like you would really like to shine a light on? And what are the communities that are just underrepresented in all media? It's a little like, um, you remember uh, Mr. Rogers, we're all having to share? Thank you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, going back to the key issues would be education be one. Mm -hmm. You know, and as uh, the key issues in our community may not be the key issues in other communities, but the whole issue around the water would be another one. Fracking may be one in northeast Ohio that they want to talk about. Human trafficking in Toledo. So I think it depends on the, the community, and those issues are vital uh, to those community interests. So for me, uh, I don't know, I think that answers your question, but I would say the community would drive those issues and, and hopefully the media in our communities, and because we're talking about Dayton and Springfield, uh, the local media would, uh, would be interested and help drive the community conversation around those key community issues. So we've about come to that point where it's time for your questions. But before we do that, I was hoping that Patty Newberry from um, Miami University might get up. She's also the president of uh, pr the president of the Society of Professional Journalists, and I knew that that she might want to make a few comments. You, you didn't know that you were going to be put on the hot spot. Yeah, we're just, right. you know, we were just really grateful that you made the trip here, and we uh, we know that you have things to say, and welcome. Oh, and apparently you have to basically eat the mic. Thank you uh, for introducing me. I am Patty Newberry. I teach at Miami of Ohio, where I'm the area director of the journalism program. This is very helpful. I live in the Cincinnati market. We're very concerned in Cincinnati about the possibility of Gatehouse taking over Gannett which would be another death blow to the world of journalism, especially newspaper journalism. So this is very helpful. And I guess I would just, number one, thank you. But number two, ask what beyond signing the petition uh, to stop this, to have the FCC intervene, stop this, what else can local readers, residents do to um, forestall this and to support other kinds of innovations in the world of journalism? Um, are there, for example, in the community of Dayton, other public media uh, organizations that need your dollars, aside from WISO, um, right? What are the other alternatives for folks who are here? Thank you. So before I, I, I handed this uh, to Yosef, because I thought, oh, well, this is the perfect thing for him to say. But I don't know if you've noticed that there are cameras here today. Now, that is because Dayton, the public access station is here. This is DATV that is here. Thank goodness that we have them because this, you know, it's good that we're able to come and sit here. Um, but let's face it, if we had two-year-olds and three-year-olds, we'd be at home with them. And it might be nice to be able to watch this on television. So a big thank you to them. But also... <laughs> And we need to be thinking of ways that we can get information out and be as supportive as possible of these kind of public access, public information venues. And on that note, I'm handing it over to Yosef. Thanks, and thanks for the question. Um, I'm happy to speak about the first part and what the community or you as individuals can do beyond filing comments at the FCC. So I, I keep mentioning this, public airwaves are a resource that we all own. So there are other ways to get engaged uh, other than filing at the FCC. One is to actually contact your member of Congress who uh, has a lot of uh, power in saying what the FCC can and cannot be doing. 
Uh, maybe not your member of Congress here, but this is, this is again, uh, pulling levers at various, uh, at senators. Uh, Senator Sherrod Brown, I think, is much better at this than your local member of Congress is. Uh, but actually talking to uh, the mayor, who is here today, who can also voice her concerns. The state legislators, there, there are a lot of actual elected officials who can voice their concerns and hold uh, Dayton Daily News and the television station, as well as Apollo accountable for their actions. Uh, other than that, it's raising awareness within the community, talking to folks who aren't here today and telling them what's going on in Dayton. It's writing to the uh, uh, newspaper in Dayton and expressing your concern about what might happen, writing to the television station, expressing your concern about what might happen, or letters to the editor, or op-eds. There are a lot of other ways to actually get engaged the beyond the FCC, but it's the, the, uh, the compilation of all of these things that are going to raise this issue up for a lot of attention. Does anybody else want to comment on this? I wanted to just mention, excuse me, I, I'll, we wrapped up like three times, you said, okay. That's all right. Uh, two, I really am glad DATV is here. You may ask how DATV is funded. DATV is funded through the city of Dayton. They use their franchise fees. It's a decision of the city commission to provide that. Quite frankly, most communities don't do that anymore. So that's another example of how you can get active. You know, with, uh, I, I don't think a lot of you are from Dayton. Perhaps you could talk to your communities about how they can support access to, to, um, to these efforts considering that we're, we're in a crisis in journalism. And then, of course, I think everyone in this room listens to YSO, support of YSO and public radio is really, really important for our community. Uh, yes, you see people that are clapping that are happy about it. <laughs> and then finally, I would encourage to like, uh, get involved. If you, So you say you live in Washington Township, go, go to DATV and get involved. They need volunteers. It's run also by volunteers. Go get involved and engaged and access information because it's going to be important more and more as the disruption of journalism occurs. Anybody else want to add? Oh, please. Oh, and there is a microphone right there. Go for it. So I'm not DATV, I'm David Ezrati. I've been writing a blog in Dayton since 2005. There are over 2,900 posts, a lot concerning local political things. I've got a YouTube channel with 500 some videos of meetings like this. Ooh, that's good advice. Don, excuse me. I'm answering the question. So the FCC is not going to step in. The business model of newspapers and television stations is broken. You have to do some diff very different things. And the thing you have to understand is advertisers, which I happen to, I own an ad agency, so I'm a little more tuned into this. They don't want broadcast anymore. They want to be able to pick individual people. And media, as it has right now, doesn't have that model without going through somebody like Google, Facebook, YouTube, these are the, the controllers of all this. And that's where the money is. The only thing where there's money in local television anymore and advertising is political season. That's where they make a majority of their money. And the reason they make the money is because politicians have to reach people who are not connected, the digital divide, where they can force it down your throats and you can't have an ad blocker where you can't skip it, where there's still some content around it that you want to read. You are not going to change this model. And what's going to need to happen is there needs to be an internet tax. It should have happened long ago because local businesses were competing with people who didn't have to pay a sales tax. Now it's sort of changed because Amazon is everywhere. But there needs to be a tax on internet usage and internet usage Internet access has to be made universally available, so there is no digital divide. Let's hear from the panelists. Uh, what do you think about an internet tax? So, you said a lot of things. I want to address a couple of them. On advertising, I 100% agree with you. Political advertising is the main source of revenue for broadcast TV. And it's still a significant source of revenue. Uh, in the 2018 midterm elections, I think broadcast TV made about $3 billion in political revenue. 
five, five billion dollars. That's much more than social media or digital platforms. So that's where the, the money is, and that's going to be where the money is for quite some time. Uh, and that's why you have private equity firms trying to get into this, saying this is how we get senators elected. Second point, internet tax. There's a lot of forms of an internet tax. Are you, we could be talking about a tax where everyone who has access to the internet pays into this. Or we could be talking about a social media tax where companies like Facebook and Google pay a percentage of their revenue that goes into local journalism. I don't know which is the most viable. These are advertising, the th internet advertising tax. Right now it is not taxed. Right now it is not taxed. That, that's right. one idea. Facebook is just getting very rich. That's and one so idea. Is Google. But the, the, the bigger issue is the advertising model is not sustainable anymore for, for journalists. Exactly. And instead of trying to figure out how to completely attack Facebook and Google, which has a lot of problems, I will 100% agree with you, we have to think about other ways to get journalists and journalism into different sources of, of, of revenue or figure out is a nonprofit model viable, is the public funding model viable, is the tax viable. Um, these are all options we have to think about because we all know that advertising isn't going to solve the problem anymore. So the, the other problem is we can demand that all our local public bodies broadcast or record and put their meetings on YouTube. It doesn't Absolutely. cost. Absolutely. Having, it's interesting. I don't know if you noticed outside, there was a turn the cameras on. And that campaign is just telling our state senators to please turn the cameras on. So I don't know if you've noticed behind you, there is a, there's a group of people who have questions. These are, and so what I would encourage all of us to do sure. is after we've wrapped up, we can have visits with one another. Um, so Ellis, what's your question? <laughs> Well, uh, hey, thank you all for being here. Uh, this has been a really good panel and, and a terrific turnout. So it shows that there's a lot of interest in this. And um, when I think about this particular issue, it does seem really daunting. And I'm inclined to want to focus on the, the, you know, I'm a half full glass kind of guy. And the half full glass is the fact that there is some nonprofit, there are some nonprofit models that seem to be working. And so I'm kind of lucky that the woman right behind me is Nina Ellis, who is the <laughs> station manager for WISO. And so really, I'm just here as her hype man. You know, I'm, I'm here to uh, basically introduce Nina Ellis. <laughs> WISO started out as an 11 watt radio station 61 years ago in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And because it's been supported by the community for 61 years, it's grown into a 50,000 watt flamethrower yeah. that we reach from northern Cincinnati up to almost Wapakoneta, almost to uh, Columbus now. And if you have a really good car radio, you can get us all the way to Richmond, Indiana. Two million people live in that listening area, and it's grown because listeners, citizens, made that happen. It took a long time, <laughs> it took 61 years for us to get to this point, but we are now a 50,000 watt community owned radio station. I'm telling you all some news that hasn't been made public yet, but the FCC just approved our transfer to a community organization. So people are saying, you know, what can we do to support a different kind of alternative? Um, public radio around the nation is grown. Um, the largest newsroom right now, newsroom of any kind, in the state of Colorado is Colorado Public Radio. WISO is not the biggest newsroom in the state of Ohio, but now that we're independent, we have set our sights on growing our newsroom as a priority for us. So um, I want people to know that public radio is a long-lasting, viable alternative to profit-based media. And if you don't believe me about WISO, go to any public radio website in any of the 50 states. Um, I also want to give a super big shout out to Megan Bachman, who's the editor of the Yellow Springs News, 
a weekly newspaper, an award-winning newspaper. They worked their butts off for a town of 3,000 people. And what can you do? Why don't you subscribe to the Yellow Springs News, or at least go to their website? We have 70,000 listeners, 6,000 members. So there's something you can do, you know, to institutions that already exist, that are already community supported. We are totally, totally backing our colleagues at the Dayton Daily News. We don't want to be here without them. But I want you to know that there are other models that work uh, where citizens drive the funding. Thank you. Um, so do any of the panelists want to comment on that? All right, so so right now we're gonna we're moving into the question part of the program. Um, so I'd love to hear a question. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, the deal is not closed yet. It's pending approval. They haven't actually officially signed the papers yet. Uh, and why do they want to sell it is because, as other panelists have mentioned, the models for journalism aren't as profitable anymore. These are maybe distressed assets or assets that just aren't making as much money, and this is prime opportunity for a private equity firm to get in there. All right. So, sir, would so, you like to ask a question? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Nina, you sound exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, kudos to, to Jim and kudos to all the, these um, people. I, I, I'm a subscriber to Dayton Daily News. I'm a subscriber to the New York Times. You are absolutely right, and that is you have to pay. Yeah, because if you don't pay, then, then this, you may get Fox News. So, um, so, so my question is, can you tell us a little bit about the elephant in the room, which is who is Apollo? And who are these people that are trying to buy this? Because uh, I lived in a third world country where we used to get news from an airplane that circled our country in Vietnam through the VOA and through the BBC. And uh, so if you don't get um, the news, the correct news, you get propaganda. And so who is behind Apollo? Is that, is that the Fox News or is that who, who are these people that are trying to get this? They're not journalists. They, uh, they're no, no, but the owner, right? They, they want uh, to own Le this. Leon Black. Yeah. Uh, there are a, a couple other executives in this firm that ma manage day-to-day -day functions. They have similar business practices in other industries where they just take over distressed assets, squeeze the profits out, and sell it back. This is the extent of my knowledge of them. Uh, funny that you mentioned this. Uh, Apollo is actually trying to buy all of Cox's radio stations right now. This is a separate transaction from Cox's television stations. But they're running into some trouble because there are some foreign ownership rules that come with owning radio stations. China? Uh, and Cox's uh, main shareholders uh, have voting interests based in the Cayman Islands. That's kind of where they, they're operating. Even though they're a US-based company, their voting interests are in the Cayman Islands. That shows you kind of the uh, ambiguity of where, where they're coming from and kind of where their business practice is. As far as I know, they don't have any background in journalism. They don't care about journalism. They just want to make money, and they see this as a, a profitable thing. Or is it they want you to, to think that they don't have anything, any agenda behind that? The so this is very dangerous, and so we should not let that happen, yes? Correct. Yeah, thank you. All right, next question. OK. I've been, just a little preface, I've been reading a lot about authoritarianism the past couple of years and the rise of authoritarianism and one of the first things to go is the free press. And, uh, you know, Hitler called it the lying press. We're hearing fake news now, all these attacks on the media. Journalists are being murdered in places like Turkey and Russia. You know, but this this is all happening in our country, you know, because of, of the things that you've just told us about, I'm wondering uh, what, what's the interface between kind of the, the rise of authoritarianism and the decline of the free press internationally? And I'm thinking of you, Joel, with, you know, internationally, you know. So, 
so uh, thank you for the question. Um, the way I would pitch it is to think of uh, the media concentration as sort of uh, an intervening or facilitating kind of variable, right? So Fox News didn't allow this to happen, that is to say, the rise of the Trump administration, but they facilitated it in a certain sense. And so in as much as we want to point to that, so it's not the same as state television, there's a, just a different sort of new animal, and it, it's problematic if it's unchallenged, but it's also very well challenged, right? So, you know, I, mean, I think this is, goes to maybe Ellis's glass half full thing, is that, you know, for as much of media concentration or consolidation as we're seeing, we're also seeing, uh, and I think Jamie mentioned this too, an unbelievable uh, investigative work being done on the border, being done in prisons across the country, on the campaign finance side. I mean, there's been, there's been great coverage exposing corruption, exposing abuse, exposing all these things. Um, a lot of that has come through consolidated newsrooms, but much of it has been, and some of it's Washington Post and whatever, but the border stuff, for instance, has been local uh, journalists. And, you know, I think the same is also true, in, you know, in terms of authoritarianism, the challenge to it is that as much as we've, you know, uh, seen a rise in uh, this kind of a trend, we've also seen a, 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 a historic response to it from the public. Right, and so the, half, the glass half full thing is, even if young people aren't reading the daily news, with all due respect, they seem to be very energized on a range of issues, whether it's immigration or climate or, or anything else. And so I think the pieces are not sort of all there yet. Young people uh, who are very much engaged in politics and, 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 and challenging abuse and, and challenging for transparency and whatever else, they're getting their information from somewhere and they're sharing it and they're showing up. They're showing up to block the doors to, uh, you know, ICE offices, and they're showing up to be arrested in the rotunda, you know, for all these other. So, yes, I'm concerned with, you know, the attacks on the free press, and, and I'm concerned with media consolidation. But I think over the last two years, uh, two and a half years, we've really seen a kind of swelling of remarkable journalism and and historic activism. And so understanding how those things are, are interrelated, I think, is sort of an additional challenge. I'd I, I just add, I think Joel makes a good point about young people being really interested. But again, they're only really interested in national issues. And so that's the concern I have as we talk about these local pieces, that there's not a lot of local connection to young people. And so there's no interest there. And so when people don't read local journalism, then yeah, ICE national trump but like what's happening to my community that i live in i don't i don't see that activism in local people and that's the uh, young people with locals and that's a concerning issue when we talk about local communities overall i'd like to tell you that um in the course of my job i have the privilege of traveling the world and training and meeting journalists from all over the all over the globe um four times in the last three years i have been overseas training journalists, um, most recently in Malta, which is a very democratic country. In fact, every country that I've been in and I'm going to mention is democratic. Ethiopia, Uganda, um, Malta, Moldova, all of those are democratic countries that are faced with the same issues that we are when it comes to fake news. Um, it is a we don't even like using the term fake news anymore because it's become so cliche because it's much more sinister than that. In, in Moldova, um, the Russians are very active in the Moldovan um, media landscape and they plant stories and they're constantly trying to, essentially what they wanna do is they wanna convert Moldova back to a Soviet state, right? It's happening in Ethiopia, it's happening in a lot of different countries, and it doesn't have to be authoritarian. I don't want you to think that, that this is just a, a product of authoritarian regimes. This, a lot of times this is a smoke screen to keep the public off guard so that politicians can do what they want to do and not be held accountable. Um, in Malta, um, they have an enormous problem we have a problem in this country because it starts at the top and it's trickled down. We, we have documented incidents where high school journalists going to a coach or a teacher or someone to ask them to be interviewed for the school newspaper are being accused of pandering in fake news.
because it becomes a slur. I don't like what you're writing about. I don't want to talk to you. So therefore, you're fake, right? This isn't so much about authoritarianism at, elsewhere as it is about maintaining control and keeping the news that they don't want in the papers and on the air away from the public. So we're going to do this kind of popcorn style, which means I'm going to hand the microphone over. Because we're hitting time, I'm going to have you ask one quick question, and then whoever wants to jump in will answer, and we'll just go through the five folks that are in line right now, and whoever wants to take it. Um, and so, Andy, do you want to ask your question? Well, I want to make a point. I'm glad that you question, brought, brought up Dayton Access Television here, because the, that media model, the point that we're talking here tonight about alternative uh, media models is the point because the old model is done. I think D Dayton Access Television and community media has, gives us a working template for how to do this. The idea, David mentioned this about the internet thing, of course this is a bigger question, but you get into the issues about how you can apply taxes or what with the media model of Dayton Access TV and public access, franchise fees on the internet to fund what is a civic good and a civic need. That is how these organizations operate. So, so how do you do this and how can it be done and how do you do it? And of course the issue is going to get bigger because in the end all of this comes down to politics. Yusuf El Zain, and uh, democracy is having two Yusufs in the room, and we're not deported. So this is, this is democracy. M my question is: Are we meeting here for democracy? Closer to the microphone. For, I'm, I hear myself now. Uh, are we meeting here for democracy, or we're against merger? How can we fight for a, the media outlet that is only a bullhorn for the most racist, most abusive person on the earth? So, what are we really meeting for? against merger or we're really fighting against democracy? And Bob, I am a, a previous server of the, of the public sector. I was a city employee. If you really want to quote the FBI that city of Dayton has a culture of corruption, that's fake news. I can assure you that in my presence at the city of Dayton, I didn't face any corruption. So that shouldn't be repeated because that's only abu abusive to the public sector employees, to the ex-employees, and to every employee that works for the city. Thank you. I, I got a real quick question because I know there's a line here, but the thing that's kind of scary to me, and I'm glad I'm the type that a big supporter of public broadcasting, WYSO, I also, also take the time to read other media, but it really, what really scares me, uh, this is all well and good, but people in general, especially nowadays, and I, I kind of get animated here, is they don't have the ability you know, to think critically, you know, the fake news, if they don't agree with something, they say, well, it's fake news or the media has a bias. In a democracy, this isn't like Russia where Putin owns the press through grass, gas prone or in China where they own the press. You have to think objectively and critically. And that's one of the problems I see with people in general. That's really kind of my comment. I'm going to just uh, turn it over to other people. I, need, I never need to respond to the question about the, the city of Dayton. Uh, the fact that the FBI says there is a, a, a culture of corruption, that's news. Now, I agree with you. I wrote a master's thesis on city manager government in Dayton in 1968, and I have thought of the city of Dayton as a shining city on the hill in all that time. I am, I am concerned, as you are, about whether that's true or not. I, I'm not going to speak for the media. All right, on that note, we have two people left. Who, in, in, if you don't have a question, you must sit down. Okay. <laughs> the question, what is yes, the question? Yes, thank you. I want to go back to the sale of Cox Media. And, John, I have a quick question to you for me to ask my question. How many stations are there involved in that sale? Uh, in total, it's 25 stations between Cox and Northwest Broadcasting. I believe Cox has 12 or 13, and then Northwest has the other 12. How possible is it for us to collaborate 
with the citizens, the mayors of those communities to launch a combined effort it's definitely to possible. address this. It's possible to coordinate with the other states, the other local governments to get a letter of mayor's concern or state legislators or members of Congress, not Dayton's, to actually uh, voice their concerns about this. Mayor Daly, can you make that happen? Well, Whaley, not Daly. <laughs> I do not have that much power. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I can work with Common Cause to see the cities, and I have close relationships with mayors across the country, so we can start working on that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for bringing it up. Question. I just, I'm seeking clarification. Is this Cox, Ohio, Cox Media, Ohio selling everything? Is it Cox out of Atlanta selling just the news stations? I'm, I'm really confused over what entity Apollo is buying. They're buying Cox Media Group, uh, so all of the television stations that the Cox entity owns. But, but is that out of Atlanta? Atlanta yeah. Or is that Ohio? Like yeah. I'll double check on that. I don't think so. I think it's just the television stations, but I'll double check. Okay. My understanding is that Cox is keeping only the Atlanta Constitution uh, Journal. Right. Right. I think everything's going to be gone except the Atlanta Constitution. Yeah. I'm really annoyed by that. I thought we were the flagship. Why don't they keep us and sell the rest, right? Started here, right? right. I mean, Governor Cox would not like this at all. Um, I think one of the things that um, was discussed briefly, on, I believe it was on a conference call that this group had that should be of concern to all of you is that also pending before the, um, before the FCC is this, and, and Patty had mentioned this, Gatehouse Media buying Gannett, okay? Those are two heavy hitters in this arena. Gannett is, at one time, was the largest newspaper chain in the country, owned New, uh, the USA Today and a number of papers. That is going to get a lot of attention because when, they, when their merger is done, there will be 265 papers in this country under one flagship. And to give, put that in perspective for you, one out of every six newspapers in the United States will be owned by one company. That's going to get a lot of attention. And this, what you're talking about here, is very likely to fly under the radar. And so if you want to be active in this and you want to, and you want to question this and prevent this, then it's going to require a lot of effort on your part because it'll be very easy for the government to say, well, we, we need to focus on this, we'll grant this. I can add a little footnote to that. In 1972, the Dayton Daily News was the most liberal paper in the state of Ohio. But Atlanta, the Cox people in Atlanta, mandated that every Cox newspaper endorse Richard Nixon. And Jim Fain went along with it. Greg Fav, who used to be the managing editor in Dayton, and later went to West Palm Beach as editor. His paper endorsed Nixon. He wrote a personal column disagreeing, and he left shortly thereafter. He became the uh, editor of the Sacramento Bee in the one year when they won two Pulitzer Prizes at the same time. So this is my friend Bill Davis who's up here wanting to ask a question. So it has got to be super short because these people have things to do. They want to go home. And for those of you who do not want to go home, our wonderful panelists will be here to visit with and ask additional questions. Okay, so B Bill, so, very quickly. Well, I, I think that this is a really good opportunity for this question, and, and that is I'm wondering if the panelists, anyone that wants to, would like to explain the fairness doctrine and how it has affected the quality of information available to the public. All right, I'm handing this to Yosef, and you've got to answer quickly because people want to go home. Real quick, the Fairness Doctrine is this principle that news media outlets should broadcast both sides of a controversial issue. It's a policy we had on the books quite a while ago. It got removed by the Reagan administration. Long story short, it's very unlikely for it to come back given the uh, political ramifications of it. Uh, a quick anecdote, uh, the, the Fairness Doctrine's repeal gave rise to conservative talk radio and Fox News and uh, other uh, 
extremists or more um, leftist or conservative outlets that, that way. What we try and do, instead of fighting for that, is to promote more independent and diverse voices in our media that will counteract some of that. I would like to tell you all thank you so much for coming. We are, and also to say thank you to the panelists and the people who spent a lot of time planning this. So anybody who would like to visit with a panelist, they'll meet you out there, um, and you can have a, ask them as many questions as you have. Um, and once again, thank you so much for coming. Enjoy your evening. Bye, everybody.